Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, this is the Center for the Study of Women in Society's uh, noon talk series. Uh, we're really happy today to uh, be pre uh, presenting John Jarmillo, who's um, in the uh, Romance Languages Department and who is also our Jane Grant Dissertation Fellow for this year. So um, his work is very exciting and uh, we're really uh, uh, pleased to be able to have him with us today. Um, one thing I wanted to say is that this is an ongoing series that we have uh, both for this term and spring term. Um, the noon talks are typically fe feature our uh, graduate students and faculty who have received grants from CSWS. Um, and it's an opportunity for them to share their work with you. Um, I am putting in the chat, get this to go. There we go. And the chat is um, uh, several links for more information uh, where you can find out more about the noon talks we have coming up, as well as um, opportunities to become a faculty affiliate or a graduate student affiliate with CSWS and just get yourself on our listserv so you can find out what's going on. With that, I'm going to hand it over to John. John, take it away. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here today. Um, I want to thank the Center for the Study of Women and Society uh, for honoring me with this uh, prestigious Jane Grant Dissertation Fellowship. Um, I'm going to share the screen here. Uh, let's see, is this slideshow okay? Can everyone see that? Okay. Before I begin, uh, I need to say that all the translations uh, in this presentation are my own. Today, I present part of the research from my dissertation entitled Viral Bodies, AIDS, and Other Contagions in Latin American Narrative. I analyze a few examples of what I call viral bodies, which materialize in Pedro Lemebel's Le Guafan, the documentary Lemebel by Joanna Raposi, and Las Yeguas del Apocalipsis. After I briefly outline the fields of virality, contagion, and transfeminism, which led to the theorization of viral bodies, I will examine several examples from Lemebel's work that will highlight the virality of, transfemi of, of transfeminism in his art. In the biological realm, Viral bodies are the individual variants which contaminate other bodies. My dissertation proposes the materialization of viral bodies in other realms, human, metaphorical, ideological, linguistic, literary, and textual. Yes, even books themselves can be viral bodies as we shall soon see. Viral bodies are subjected to quarantines and inoculations precisely because they can infect, disrupt, and destabilize established mechanisms of power. Viral bodies can be used by those in power to infect imaginations, enforce norms, indoctrinate subjects, and justify censorship, quarantines, and exile. These conditions impact the bodies of marginalized people the most because they force them into precarious ways of living and being. However, viral bodies can also be wielded to wage counter offensives, such as those Pedro Lemebel materializes toward gender and sexual oppression. The growing fields of virality and contagion are products of tremendously accelerated sociopolitical, economic, environmental, and ecological alterations that have materialized due to the lightning speed of techno-scientific innovation since the early 19th century. I'm thinking of the telegram as one of the first means of mass communication. Virality studies how events become viral as they spread through the internet via social media. Contagion studies uh, the virulence of metaphors and how their transgressive spread jumps across imaginary frontiers of identity and notions of essence and immunity. Peter Mitchell in Contagious Metaphor ambitiously demonstrates how at the crossroads of humanities, 
social studies, medical, and philosophical discourses beginning in the 1960s and 70s, metaphor as contagion increasingly gains currency in the social, affective, mental, emotional, financial, moral, religious, political, and narrative realms. Her aim is to, quote, suggest a framework through which the emergence and often epidemic-like reproduction of metaphor in general can be understood, end quote. By the late 1990s, contagion studies evolves into an interdisciplinary field that goes beyond epidemiological facts to, increase, to address questions about how beliefs circulate in politics, religion, and society through social interactions. Fear and epistemological anxiety triggered by viral events are often the primary vectors of contagion. Political and social interactions, I think I missed a slide here, excuse me. There we go. Political and social interactions often produce viral events, which lead to the creation of contagious metaphors and viral bodies but they do not always become movements. Viral events are more often dramatic and immediate. Two examples of viral events are a military coup that leads to the systematic disappearance and cleansing of opposing political bodies, like what happened in Chile in Operation Condor in the 1970s, and the interspecies transmission of variants that led to a global pandemic like HIV AIDS in the 1980s. These are examples of viral events because they invoke ideological firestorms. They also gener generate viral bodies which spread contagious metaphors which contaminate and infect other bodies and imaginations. Examples of contagious metaphors arising from the aforementioned viral events are nunca mas, never more in the case of Pinochet's Chile, and act up, fight back, fight AIDS in the case of HIV AIDS. Viral events can also lead to social and civil rights movements since the virulence of their metaphors oblige people to take a position. Viral events can arise from anywhere and from a range of political, social, or environmental situations. Another example of a viral event was the publication of the book gender trouble in 1990. When feminist philosopher Judith Butler proposed that gender was a source of trouble, she was not kidding. Butler, who identifies as a non-binary lesbian, is probably the most influential gender theorist because she sees gender as performatively constructed through behavior. Hence, other genders are possible via different behaviors. The philosophical questions Butler addresses in the book transformed the fields of lesbian, gay, queer, women, gender, and transgender studies. The book has been met with both applause and criticism. That brings me now to the transgendered body and the growing field of transfeminism conceptualized in both North and South America. Within the rainbow spectrum, trans and gendered issues are fueling the contemporary backlash we see from the triumphant resurgence of authoritarianism. I argue that the transgendered body is a viral body because it destabilizes binary notions of sex and gender, which have long been the currency of patriarchal power. In many social realms throughout the world, the transgendered body is treated as a pariah, because it is regarded as a contagion that threatens to undo the social order. Among those in Latin America who see the transgendered body as a threat, the contagious metaphor gender ideology has become an epidemic-like movement. At opposition rallies and marches, one hears and sees another contagious metaphor, hashtag con mis hijos no te metas, which means don't mess with my children. The hysteria that arises around that perceived threat of gender ideology reminds me of Lee Edelman's proposal in No Future of reproductive futurism and the fascism of the baby's face, which impose an ideological limit on political discourse. An example is in Brazil in 2017 when uh, Judith Butler was attending uh, a seminar there. 
Uh, feminist philosopher Judith Butler, regarded by many in the opposition as one of the architects of gender ideology, was burned in effigy as conservative protesters waved Bibles and crosses, carrying banners which read, go to hell and yelling, burn the witch, invoking colonial and inquisitorial practices. Those who oppose the invented threat of gender ideology seek to quarantine and censor any discussion of non-binary gender and sexuality in the classroom. Their authority is based on opinion, pseudoscience, and outright distortions. They claim that gender ideology will destroy God's creation, the family. Where do politicians and religious activists get such distorted ideas that gender ideology, or shall we say gender theorists, theories are a, a conspiracy? Well, perhaps from ideas of transgender theorists, such as Kate Bornstein, who proposes that to end injustices produced by sexism, homophobia, transphobia, misogyny, and patriarchy's obligation to conform to the gender binary, gender must be completely dismantled. However, gender ideology conveniently neglects to acknowledge that transfeminism, as Emi Komoyama, Koyama has proposed, is a movement for and by trans women who see their liberation intrinsically linked to the liberation of all women, no matter who they are. Or that transfeminism does not exclude queers, intersex people, trans men, or non-trans men and women. Rather, transfeminism invites all those who sympathize with the needs of trans women and consider an alliance with them essential to their own liberation. Moreover, transgender and feminist theorist Sayat Valencia explains that trans feminism arises from what we call feminisms, which come from multiple currents and historical perspectives arising from a variety of embodied experiences and visions of the world at a political and personal level. They cannot be standardized in a definitive version. Transfeminism confronts the state of emergency faced by cisgender women, trans women, and other minorities who seek to survive the necro-political and necro-administrative contexts that continually threaten their lives. I see the growing field of transfeminism as a trench from which arises a counterattack which directly threatens the phallic fortress that panoptically stands guard over the cradle of patriarchal power. I now turn to Pedro Lemebel, whose dedication to increasing the visibility of the Boca Travesti has contaminated Chilean history. In 1986, Lemebel reads his manifesto, speaking for his difference while dressed in drag and pitting his loca embodiment and ideological imaginings against those of a crowd of virile leftist men. Lemebel's contamination of leftist politics was accomplished through a wealth of contagious metaphors. Two metaphors in the manifesto merit mentioning. Embroidering flags with birds and uh, children with a broken wing. And the quotes are here on the screen. Here, the bird metaphor at a superficial level invokes the phallus, but a deeper level, it invokes flight and freedom. The child with a broken wing could be mean one that does not conform to gender and sexual norms, but it also could be read as one whose freedom is also hindered. While reading the manifesto with his hallmark ironic and campy tone, Lemabel reveals the molecular dynamite that drives his artistic decisions. Lemabel's art uses a liberatory aesthetic that produces a counteroffensive to the exceptionalism of body politics which excludes identities and complicated by questions of sex, gender, race, ethnicity, and indigeneity. These are identities that do not fit or they're, they're trans, they're uh, cross, uh, they're multiple identities where one has many identities, not just one, that do not fit comfortably within the spectrum of, of the LGBTQ rainbow. The political gesture of this aesthetic produces a twist that turns the table on oppressors by materializing bodily resistance while using blasphemous and incendiary rhetoric 
that makes those in power uncomfortable. By using his own transgendered body as a means of inscribing political discourses, he opposes the prevailing ideologies that have historically marked bodies with meaning. Lemebel thus demonstrates his commitment to a politics that uses the body as a fulcrum to turn fissures into ruptures. In my dissertation, I go in depth referencing the concepts of radical exteriority from philosopher uh, Alejandro Vega, uh, Avallega, trench baroque from activist and author Nestor Perlonger, and tremendismo from author and publisher Pia Barros. I argue that using these three aesthetics, Lemebel criticizes the coloniality of power through this intensification and bulging of language, unleashes a scandalous explosion of pornographic surrealism using a bastardized Spanish hypersyntax while tearing the social fabric to create new spaces from which bodies can see, speak, and become. The radical exteriority of the contagious metaphor is the mechanism that helps his viral bodies to destabilize complacent beliefs and ideologies that offer a false sense of immunity and hygiene. I would now like to focus on an interview that Lemebel gave to the journalist Flavia Costa in 2004 for the magazine Enya shortly after the release of another book called San Juan de la Guada. During the interview, Lemebel explains how he uses contagion in his art. Lemebel says, I quote, for me, there is always a political decision that triggers the staging of my eruptions in the cultural field. Moreover, the genres, writing, visuality, activism are contaminated according to the impulse of my affections and resentments. Here we can see how Lemebel is aware that his, that, uh, his eruptions in the public sphere have a viral quality. The interview shows us Lemebel's commitment to the radical exteriority of his viral body, his self-ascribed ugly, crazy, homosexual body that he says could be seen from the satellites. The candor and truthfulness of his words are instruments of his radical visibility. In this next slide, we see Lemebel's first three books. The first, Incontables, was published clandestinely by Pia Barros in 1986 during the Pinochet dictatorship at her publishing house, Ergo Sum, which was literally at her house. And the second is La Esquina es Mi Corazón, published by Long. This is his first commercial release. And remember, I told you I would offer an example of a book as a viral body. Well, Marisol Vera, the executive editor of Cuarto Propio, remembers what happened when his first controversial publication was released. When democracy in Chile was just beginning a foothold under threats by Pinochet and censorship still weighed heavily on the minds of bookstore entrepreneurs. The image of Pedro Lemebel with the beatific crown of syringes at a time when AIDS was a huge stigma is part of a collection of photographs produced by Debo Diaz prior to a Lemebel performance that I will analyze, analyze just uh, shortly. Vera says, and I quote, the idea was that if we were to publish the book, it should show all its disruptive commitment there were few bookstores willing to accept it, and those few that did would not exhibit them on their shelves. I contend that this book was a textual viral body, conjured by Lemebel to upset the establishment. It was a political gesture that links the visual art of his performative body with the textual body of the book and his voice in the chronicles inside. The cover is like an alert. Inside, there is something dangerous and contaminated, as if to say, if you meet me on the corner, I might infect you. In contrast, the cover of Loco Afan, published by Long, is, turned, is toned down. It uses an image of Lemebel and Casas against a dark background, displaying flowers and birds. Perhaps this was an editorial decision given the viral reaction to the first commercial release. Regarding the controversy of his book, Lemebel says that he prefers to use living bodies to interact with, to intersect the themes of AIDS and homosexuality. He does not work from the point of view of medicine and the virus, 
Rather, he works the disease from the point of view of bodies with a gesture of contempt toward the white male Christian gaze upon the disease. His gaze peers back from the third world and has no other option than to laugh, like the laugh of the Medusa. The laughter refuses the oppressor's opposed tattoo of pain. In this next example, Emma Bell was invited to the 25th year anniversary celebration of the Stonewall insurrection when he decided to participate in the gay pride parade of Christopher Street. While wearing his crown of syringes, he uses his body to convey a political message. He carries a banner that reads, Chile return AIDS. The English grammar error is serendipitous because it helps the metaphor become contagious and amplifies the impact of his malnourished third world viral body, all while creating an uncomfortable dissonance that disrupts the imaginations of parade participants and onlookers. In his, uh, the, his chronicle about his visit to the Stonewall Bar in New York, he writes, and I quote, a dark bar, sanctuary of the homosexual cause where the sodomy tourists come to deposit their floral offerings, end quote. Lemma Bell expresses his discomfort before them, and I quote, the veteran hypocrites who resisted the harassment of the law, the police aggression that tried to evict them without success, end quote. Lemma Bell says that he had to feign, uh, feign gratitude because they were feeding him and because those, I quote, militant gringas so pious and mercantile with their political history, crowned with roses and colored ribbons in the window of the Stonewall Bar, decorated like a cake with their Colisa fashion outfits, are paying him. In the revolt for homosexual liberation, those North American locas resisted the police for several days. Moreover, Lemma Bell also expresses his discomfort while facing, I quote, the Olympus of powerful and well-fed homosexuals who look at you with disgust as if saying, we're doing you a favor, little Indian girl, bringing you to the Cathedral of Gay Pride. It is not difficult to imagine Lemma Bell as a small indigenous transvestite, David, facing the giant leather-clad Goliath. Like those men who appear in the drawings by Tom of Finland, Lemma Bell throws his pebble of assiduous Latin American criticism against them. And I quote, their stores full of sadomasochistic fetishes, nails, hooks, screws, piercings, and all that metal crap to torture your skin. Ouch, how painful. What a fright to see that group of leather men on the corner with their motorcycles, mustaches, leather boots, and that fascist brutality that reminds you of male gangs in Chile, end quote. At the end of the chronicle, Lemma Bell's viral body departs from the classic muscular homosexual aesthetic in search of more contaminated bars where the Latin soul salutes its territorial song. In 2019, when I traveled to Santiago to interview Pia Barros, I arrived when the expository film on the bell by Joanna Raposi was going to be released. Two different posters promoted the film with iconic images of Lemma Bell around the city. One image, softened by a slight blur, is what we might call a Hollywood glamour shot. Lemma Bell's face with luscious pink lipstick, uh, blue gray eyeshadow, black eyebrows and eyeliner, and his face framed by a red feather boa. I saw this image in almost every subway station and bookstore that I visited during my stay. In the film, the image is projected onto the concrete surfaces of several buildings constructed by the Allende administration that are now abandoned. Furthermore, the image is projected onto the exterior wall of Lemma Bell's apartment next to the front door, and at other times onto the rough surface of the mannequin human-like form, while the voices of the director and the artist discuss the historical context of the AIDS epidemic and the historical memory of places. The projection of this image in all the public spaces of the city underlines the ubiquity of Lemma Bell in Santiago's panorama. 
Finally, to demonstrate the increasing virulence of Lemebel's persona, I paused to gaze at another image of his face. This face was photographed by Pedro Marinello in 1990. It debuts on the cover of another book by Pedro Lemebel called Adios Maripita Linda, published by Del Bolsillo Publishing House. The face clearly blurs the perception of body gender. Above the eyes, starting at the bridge of the nose, is a hummingbird unibrow evoking the face of Frida Kahlo. The black wings of the hummingbird spread out in semicircles over the eyes. Now, here is Raposi's movie premiere poster showing the same face, but now it's painted in such a way that many at first glance might consider it a clown. However, there are many illusions transmitted in this image. When looking at the image, you cannot be sure if the face was painted and photographed as it appears, or if the colorful images were added with a digital tool. However, we see how the same face continues to bewitch the artists who created the publicity for the film. Below the title of the film, there is a subtitle that reads A Queer Revolution. It's sort of like how they put an epigraph at the title of a poem or a story to kind of give you an idea of what it's about. Um, I argue that the composition of this painted face cuts across the fissures of race, gender, sexuality, ethnicity, indigeneity, and religion in Chilean society by provoking and evoking symbolic and metaphorical meanings. And I will explain some of those in this next image. Now let's move on to the cover of Rock Axis magazine, where the same face appears the following year but now with an even more, even more intense colors and more stylized details. I contend that the contagious metaphors of conceptualization undergo further virilization that evokes historical memory. The chin is a pink semicircle with vintage gold and tomato colored coronal flames emanating towards the ruby red lips framed by a mustache on top of a triangular soul patch pointing straight down. Both are turquoise blue. These elements give the impression of a strange pink sun that rises above the horizon to greet the red lips, which seem about to take flight. Just above the mustache protruding from the earlobes toward the nose are two blue circum cur curvilinear thorny branches reminiscent of the crown of thorns associated with the religious iconography of Jesus. Tiny drops of blood drip from where the thorns pierce the skin. The impression is that the branches try to silence the mouth and prevent it from reaching the heavens. Additionally, we see what appear to be, appears to be a miniature Moai statue made of alabaster or ivory hanging from a triangular ear uh, uh, to um, the right, uh, connected to the right earlobe. On the thorny branches are three geometric shapes, two red circles, one on each cheek, and a blue triangle pointing toward uh, upward on the nose. The right nostril has a single drop of blood that drips into the mouth. The eyes are outlined with black mascara, evoking the classic Hollywood silent era. The eyes convey a sense of deep wisdom and sadness, far beyond the tears Far beyond the, the, excuse me, I lost my place. Far beyond the tears of the eyes with bloodshot capillaries, while the eyebrow hairs are painted to resemble iridescent turquoise blue feathers. The hummingbird's long red beak points toward the hairline. Above the hummingbird's wings are more coronal flames that echo with those above the chin. Just below the hairline are more blue thorny branches like a crown of thorns and additional drops of blood emanate from the points where the thorns pierce the skin, as if this forehead is sweating blood. This face fuses patriarchal Christianity, popular Hollywood, and queer iconography, while stirring the memory of the Arakanian Mapuche, Machiways, and the Rapa Nui Aborigines. In conclusion, I argue that since the death, since his death in 2015, Lemabel's viralized visage links the primitive, exotic, and distinct faces of the tribal warrior, the shaman, and the transvestite 
to re represent a transfeminist masculinity. The persona that Lemebel created has become a transcultural palimpsest, a transvestite psychopomp Stellamaris, a shamanic warrior and a heroine, an heroine, heroine goddess who leads an avant-garde of children with broken wings towards a utopian Chilean future with the complicity of several homosexual feminist and trans feminist allies. Thank you so much. So now um, I can uh, be more than happy to take questions. So I'd like to start just to kind of get us going here. Um, Hold on, I'm going to turn up my, excuse me, my sound shut off automatically. Hold that question for one second. Sure. Okay, now my sound is back. All right, got it? Okay. So um, this, this project seems so relevant, <laughs> so incredibly relevant for the era that we're in right now. And I know you must have begun this long before that, though. So um, my first question, I got two related. So how did you get involved? What brought you to this topic? And second, how has your research been informed by the pandemic and everything that we've been experiencing for the last two years? Thank you, Janae, for those um, two questions. Uh, I'll begin first by uh, saying that the reason I got involved with this topic is because um, I, uh, sorry, I'm going to get out of this slideshow that's interfering with my viewing. Okay. Um, I was diagnosed with um, AIDS in 1993, and I was told that I would not live till the year 2000. And so my personal experience of surviving this uh, disease uh, was the motivating factor for wanting to take this on as a topic for my dissertation. And uh, I, in 2000, I had created a documentary film uh, where, you know, because I had survived longer than the doctors had said I would. And so I wanted to, you know, uh, challenge the popular notion that AIDS was a death sentence. And I made my little documentary uh, from my own experience, and I called it AIDS is, uh, uh, HIV is not a death sentence. But as I got into studying at the University of Oregon, taking classes, and uh, especially the ones focusing on uh, gender, um, sexuality, and race, uh, I realized that the perspective that I had presented in my documentary was very much uh, from my point of view as a white cisgen uh, cisgendered or uh, yeah, cisgendered man and a gay man, you know, privileged with having the medications and all these, you know, uh, all this medical technology at my disposal to of Latin America, people in Latin America, Africa, uh, and other countries was completely different. And so um, I realized that I, in my dissertation, I needed to capture and reflect that uh, in my, and, and, and in a sense, maybe someday in the future, I'd like to redo my documentary and then show my journey of discovery and self-actualization uh, and awareness around these issues. And then the other part of your question was, um, can you repeat that part? Absolutely. So um, given, given your topic and particularly with the idea of viral bodies and, you know, contagion, uh, you know, theory, how has the pandemic informed your work? Oh, yes. Thanks. Thank you so much. I, I would like to say that I have seen so many parallels with the way people have reacted to the COVID-19 pandemic and the HIV AIDS pandemic. Only the difference here is that COVID gets you fast. <laughs> it happens within days, right, and weeks, whereas HIV AIDS is years, you know, months and years. And so uh, the, some of the reactions are the same, you know, the, the need for quarantine to isolate, to, uh, you know, protect yourself. And um, often, you know, like when people were reacting to HIV AIDS and were ignorant of how it was transmitted, uh, if someone died from AIDS in a hospital, the, the nurses gathered up all the things, you know, wearing all the biosecurity stuff that they had available at the time and set them on fire in a bonfire in the parking lot of the hospital. 
uh, or family would do the same thing and destroy all of the personal effects of the person who died of AIDS. And we don't do that necessarily with COVID now, you know, but uh, there's this sort of still that reaction of like, oh, stay away, isolate, uh, you know, quarantine and, and uh, the contamination and the contagion, we, we want to protect ourselves from that. And, and there's a lot of misinformation, just as there was with HIV AIDS on the uh, COVID uh, pandemic as well. Um, a lot of misinformation is being spread uh, and, some, and, and people are taking advantage of it. That's why I mentioned, you know, the triumphant resurgence of authoritarianism uh, because they, they're taking advantage of that to fan those fears and to, you know, justify wanting to take very, um, uh, you know, dramatic efforts to control people's lives and their behavior and, uh, and many other things like that. Yes. John, thank you so much for presenting your work. This project is so powerful and so exciting. So, so thank you. And I, I'm glad to, to be able to hear it today. And I also was very sorry to arrive a little bit late. So um, I may have missed um, something. So I apologize if you already talked about this, but I was wondering about um, whether you see um, some real Chilean specificity to this artist and to his tropes, or their, their tropes and um, the ways that they they represent themselves. Um, that is to say, do you does it? I I, I really appreciated the the critique of of um, the village and sort of the critique of um, of Stonewall and the sort of the the West Village bar. But I also want to know: Are there other um, yeah, just very specifically Chilean that, that might sort of stand apart from, say, what's happening in the U.S. or even perhaps what's happening in Mexico. Did you talk about that at all? Sure. Uh, thank you so much, Leah, for the uh, question. Um, I've read extensively Lemma Bell's works, and um, the first two commercial releases are very interesting uh, in that regard. La Esquina is Mi Corazón, the, the Corner is My Heart, uh, is very specific to Chilean life and culture. And although Lema Bell is constantly making allusions to popular world culture, like for example, in, the, uh, in that book, La Esquina is Mi Corazón, uh, he has one called uh, The Boy, uh, uh, New Kids on the Block, right? And so obviously that's a reference to a pop band that was popular in, in North America. But he's talking about all these new Chilean kids during the Pinochet dictatorship and how they're getting, they're becoming like sort of like hippie rocksters and using drugs and how uh, adults are exploiting them sexually uh, in the um, you know, alleys and uh, under the staircases. And he's saying, you know, um, you know, your parents are the ones who molested me, right? Those kinds of things. He's he he that particular uh, one, uh, the new kids on the block. He read in Mexico uh, when um, uh, at a uh, he was invited to present uh, his work there, uh, some of his chronicles, and um, uh, he walks out on stage in drag and reads that, and everyone's face, like from what I I read an article that said everyone's jaw dropped to the floor and they were just shocked that someone who is performing what he was in a, in, in, as an embodiment that he was performing was capable of delivering such incisive and assiduous biting. Like I used the term blasphemous and incendiary to talk about because, I mean, if you read that, it's, it's all of that. It's the pornographic surrealism. It's, it's everything. And so um, his critiques are not just you know, local, although many of them are, and, and they're intermixed with the different chronicles that he works with. Other books are dedicated very much specifically to Chile, like Zanjón de la Guada, which is talking about his origins and where he came from, this, this little um, barrio that was created from shanty, uh, little, you know, um, what do you call them, the uh, um, chozas, built, you know, out of cardboard and whatever materials they could get from the dump sites, right? And 
and people were building homes along a, a fertilization a drainage ditch. <laughs> and that's what Zanjon de la Guada was. So, he, you know, to highlight his, his humble origins, but then also at the same time to show that many of the people that supported Allende and his campaign came from those kinds of barrios within Santiago and Chile. Um, also, uh, I, I was going to say, uh, when I, before I jumped into that, uh, was his criticisms, you know, he criticizes Elizabeth Taylor. He criticizes uh, the continental philosophy. He criticizes, there, there is nothing he does not touch. He's put his hands into every possible thing he could write about. And, you know, I, I'm sure, you know, the motivation partly, a big part of the motivation were the women who were involved in his life, like Pia Barros, like um, uh, Soledad Bianchi, um, um, Carmen Berenguer, a poet, uh, a Chilean poet. All of these women were reading, you know, secretly reading because it was not allowed, right? All these things were banned by the military and by the Pinochet government. Uh, but he was reading all these books that they were saying, you know, you got to read this and you got to read that. And, and, and he even talks about it, you know, in some of his chronicles and interviews about how, you know, for example, Jacques Lacan influenced him and how Michel Foucault and how Derrida influenced him and, and Guattari and Deleuze, you know, and he's talking about transversal uh, becoming of a woman and, um, you know, desiring machines and all these things, you know, which he's taking from um, these uh, different uh, continental philosophers. And so um, I just see this as an amazing, his work as an amazing intercontinental uh, dialogue with what's happening uh, culturally, uh, sociologically, philosophically in uh, different parts of the world. Anyone else want to ask a question? Thank you, Rhianne. Thank you for being here. Uh, I do want to say uh, that I, I highly recommend reading the <laughs> novel. Uh, it's an experience, an unforgettable experience uh, to read his work. And uh, it, much of his work is, you know, now, well, it's little by little being translated, but some of it's being clandestinely translated. Um, one of the things that uh, I learned uh, in studying him was um, that he had no problem with uh, play, not plagiarism, but what do you call it? Um, um, bootlegging, <laughs> bootlegging, uh, you know, CDs, books, copies, because you had to do that under, you know, threat of military dictatorship. In order to get a copy of a book, you had to be able to somehow, you know, uh, like we do now with PDFs, we share a PDF of, a, of a, a work or we take part of it and use it in a class or something like that. So um, he actually encouraged it uh, in several interviews saying that uh, for him, it was a huge compliment that people wanted to uh, gain access to his work that otherwise would not have been able to get access without uh, those uh, illegal means and things like that. So um, there are, are a lot of things available. A lot of, a lot of his work is available online. Uh, and um, uh, there's tremendous videos on YouTube. Um, I, in, my, in the chapter, I argue that his persona is, you know, he's going viral. That's one of the parts is that now after his death, he's just, he's all over the place. Uh, and recently too, in one of his novels was adapted to a film. Um, uh, Tengo Miedo Torero, uh, which is well, in English is uh, being titled uh, My Tender Matador, which, you know, sort of uh, hints at the possibility that he may have been involved in, uh, you know, in an assassination attempt of Pinochet. <laughs> uh, it's left sort of very ambiguous. And, uh, but uh, some people say that it's somewhat autobiographical in the novel. Uh, it, it's a it's a it's a thriller and it's very interesting. Uh, I, I highly recommend both the book and the film.
I, I did want to mention one last thing. Um, I don't know how much time we have uh, left, uh, a few minutes. Um, I will be um, putting out a video. I was going to participate in the works in progress back in January, but I fell ill with a sinus infection and was unable to. Uh, oh, the film, where can you access the film? Uh, which one are you talking about? Tengo miedo, Torero. Oh, well, that one is available on Google uh, Film, Google, Google Play. Uh, and um, if you just type it in, you can find places where you can. Uh, I, I was able to obtain a copy of it there, uh, I bought. Uh, but also the documentary is available on um, Kanabi. Uh, or uh, one of those services that we have through the university where we get to see films. Um, it, it's that documentary film by Joanna Raposi is available there. Um, what was I saying? Oh yeah, uh, so I'm gonna be releasing a video uh, of what I otherwise would have presented from a different chapter, from another chapter, which is uh, about um, uh, Pablo Perez's uh, Un Año Sin Amor, right? Which is adapted to film. And it emphasizes and focuses on the other end of the spectrum. If we're going to say that, you know, uh, trans, feminist, trans feminist masculinity uh, is a spectrum. And on one end of the spectrum is the loca travesti. On the other end of the spectrum is the leather man, right? The ones who are embodying what he was criticizing uh, as the fascist uh, embodiment of masculinity. And so in, in uh, uh, Un Año Sin Amor, uh, uh, Pablo Perez is an HIV positive man who is on the verge of death, who happens to be, a, a, you know, in 1996, recording that moment when the triple therapy came out, you know, the uh, highly active antiretroviral therapy was made available. And suddenly all the people that were planning on death now had to rethink their lives and plan to live and, and survive. And so he records that as, a, as an anthropological document, but also what fascinated me when I read his book was how someone could, you know, being HIV positive and planning for death, um, be so, um, what are the, is the word that uh, they use, um, the content of philosophers, jouissance, right? He, he, he demonstrates this incredible jouissance for uh, all of the practices of the Leathermen. And when I went and did all this research about what that whole entire world was about, I, you know, I came upon uh, Tom of Finland and his drawings and the impact and how that came out of the, his experience from the Second World War and dealing with Nazis and his erotization of those bodies that he encountered. Uh, and I connect that with uh, here in Paris's A Taste for Brown Bodies and his um, uh, theorization of how, you know, through the telegram, the Latin American in, uh, imagination was, in, was, was, I use the word infected by these desires for these kinds of embodiments and, and then how uh, the leather community. So he has this triangulation between San Francisco, Paris and uh, Buenos Aires. And so uh, I'm gonna produce uh, get this video together and I'm going to post it and make it available to our RL community and I would love to get feedback because I'm in the process of finishing up the chapter right now and I you know I like challenging feedback I like criticism that you know looks at the details and says you know hey uh, uh, have you thought about this or how is this working or you know that kind of thing so uh, it makes me rethink what I've been doing and working on Well, thank you all so much for being here. It's been a great honor to have this opportunity to present part of my research. And, uh, and I, I wanna once again say thank you to the Center for the Study of Women in Society for supporting my project with the uh, prestigious Jane Grant Dissertation Fellowship. And um, thank you so much. Thank you very much, John. Oh, and uh, uh, Janae says that the video of the talk will be available so um, I'll send out the link, send me an email if you want to see the video from the very beginning and uh, catch the whole talk. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful day.
Well, Janae, thank you so much. It's been really uh, a great opportunity to 